here in just a minute. Uh, probably get going at 101 or 102 Eastern as we're letting a few people in here. So we'll just awkwardly look at each other for the next. We'll just day. stay here. Yeah, exactly. a whole bunch of people joining here so we'll give them a minute i mean we could talk about how warm it is in tucson or how cold it is in new york i like how warm it is in tucson that's better what's the best restaurant in your opinion in tucson oh i have no idea to be honest with you i've never been there i mean we go to phoenix once a month but tucson once and never so, sorry where are you guys based again uh, lincoln nebraska don't know anything about Lincoln, Nebraska. And for everyone listening to us ramble here, we're just getting started here in a minute or two as Nick takes me around the world of Lincoln, Nebraska to yeah. Tucson, Arizona. That's right. Lincoln is affectionately known as being in a flyover state. And we call it that because people just fly over. How far are you from Omaha? An hour. I saw that um, Warren Buffett's house that he grew up in was for sale. Yes. Yeah. His old one. I mean, he hasn't lived there for like 70 years, but yes. Yeah. Have you read uh, Love it? I was not scrambling to go get that. If he's, if he was selling his one that he's in right now, I mean, who knows what people would pay for that. Yeah, exactly. I think he just auctioned off a lunch with him for like over a million dollars for charity. Oh, have you, it, for those people that are just watching this while we're rambling and tell more people are here, uh the documentary on it's like uh becoming warren buffett or something like that so good i'll have to check it out i just read his book uh i like movies better than books if i'm being honest with myself so the best part is they show him do his uh, everyday drive through where he literally his wife sends him out the door with the appropriate amount of money for whichever breakfast he's gonna get at mcdonald's it's yeah like, he's a mcdonald's guy it's like two dollars and seventy-five cents. Unbelievable. The best. All right. Enough about McDonald's. More about Nick Box. So again, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for another Wednesday webinar. We're gonna get started here. And uh, for this week, we have Nick Bach from Thirty First Street Capital joining us. Nick, thanks for joining. Thank you. I uh, I know we were chatting earlier that we were like two tech guys that somehow ended up in the flooring industry and. Both of our ways into the flooring industry were uh, a little bit different and unique, but now I would say we're deep in it. Uh, but I I'm not sure, uh, maybe for some background, maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about your background of before the flooring industry and then how you ended up getting into the flooring industry. I always find that super interesting. Sure. My wife right now would be rolling her eyes because she knows that I can't tell this story in under 10 minutes, but I'm going to. Okay. Uh, this will be the 30 second version. Um, so before this, uh, I spent 16 years in technology. So uh, my, I had a business partner. We founded an IT services company, just providing IT support for small to medium-sized businesses here in good old Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and we just worked really hard growing that business for uh, 13 years. Um, and then in 2018, I sold my half uh, to him. He's still running that business and it's rocking and rolling. Um, and so my wife and I um, knew we wanted to work together at that point. Um, she's super talented, psychology background, loves strategy. So we're like, what are we going to do? Can, we can, can I ask a question there that I, I think some people might be wondering is why did, yeah. you, well, I, why did you decide to sell the business at that point? Like what about that point made you want to sell the business? Yeah, you know, um, all of my eggs were in one basket. Um, and as a business owner, and I think almost everybody on this, um, on this call would recognize this. One of the challenges of being a business owner that starts and grows a business is, you know, every job in the business and you know how to do it extremely well. And so it's really hard to let go of those things. And so for me, part of letting go was moving to a different industry that I don't know anything about. Sure. Fair enough. <laughs> I sleep better at night. Uh, that's great. Um, so some diversification in your life was a positive there. That's right. And so we just decided we were going to start a holding company and start acquiring, you know, one company a year in, you know, any industry. We were kind of looking broadly 
And we looked at hundreds of businesses. And the first one that finally fit all of our criteria was this wonderful company in Phoenix that was a flooring retailer uh, with a really great team. And so we acquired that company in 2019. And then the next year we went to buy another floor or another company, just again, like let's not buy a flooring company. And like- So you this, set out to buy any company, the first company, and it just ended up being a flooring company out of sheer yeah. coincidence. It, it matched all the criteria, you know? Okay. Uh, it's a great industry. Um, and so, yeah. Is there another business that you almost bought? Like, were you almost the Nick Bach of the bowling alley industry or? <laughs> You know, we, we bought, um, it's easy to talk about the things that we did right. Um, I always talk about, we've acquired four businesses in reality, we've acquired five. One of them was a house painting business. Um, that was also a franchise and we learned some very important lessons that we hate franchising. We definitely hate house painting. Um, and let's just say, um, we lost a medium sized house in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, on, on that acquisition. Okay. And you no longer own it. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So you bought the company in Phoenix and then you guys bought a second business about a year later. I think you said about 13 locations. Um, yeah. And so now where are you guys at? It kind of started there. Where are you guys at? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, our 2020 acquisition in Minneapolis uh, was just 13 locations, really great leadership team and great company. And they've just... I mean, they had, I think, 40% year over year growth uh, in 2021. So, you know, those two companies doing really well, we're like, I guess we're in flooring. Um, and, and it was more than that, right? It was more intentional than just saying, you know, YOLO, we're in flooring. <laughs> There's things we love about this industry. Um, and so then we said intentionally in 2021, let's, let's buy another flooring company. And so we acquired one in Chicago that was one location. Um, and we still, you know, had some uh, had some cash to deploy, and so we ended up doing a fourth deal in 2021 for a very large 23 location retailer in Houston. And are you buying the whole businesses? Are you investing? I mean, in my world, right, a lot of it is getting investments, right? We've raised 90 million dollars, but that's for like minority investments to fuel the business. Yeah, but you're different, right? You are businesses are coming to you and you're buying the whole business theoretically, correct? Yeah, there's two pieces. You know, we, we kind of use the term that we're private equity, but we're really not because the the investment um, is really just Aaron and I's, uh, my wife, Aaron, who's my business partner. It's just her and I's money. We don't have outside investors. And when we do an acquisition, our intent is to buy 100% of the company. Gotcha. That makes sense. And private equity. I mean, when I hear that word, I get squeamish a little bit and I'm sure other yeah. people do as well. But I, I would tell people listening to this call that private equity comes in many shapes and sizes. All that means in English is like private money. Right. Okay. And that can come in a whole bunch of, of different ways. Um, but so I, I guess to get into what I think a lot of people are curious about today is the actual process of buying and selling a store generally but i think we should start by talking about what is the process of actually selling a store to you guys what does that look like yeah so um if we want to pull yeah so this is the a process so we call this our proven process which for those of you that are familiar with traction this is our proven process for how we go through an acquisition so Typically, we're going to look for a company and we're going to find something that has a broker involved. Um, and so we're going to find a company that's for sale. Uh, we're going to say, is this a match? And then we're going to call and talk to the broker. Um, they're kind of the gatekeeper. We're going to call and talk to the owner after that. You know, we're going to go through all that work to say, is this the right deal? That's phase one. You know, just it's, it's like speed dating. Right. So, uh, you know, is this person match up? Then we go through the process of do, does there um, can we make them an offer that they are interested in accepting? So that's a letter of intent. Then you go through this due diligence period of 45, 60 days where um, I simply refer to it as a colonoscopy. Um, 
but it's a deep dive into every little bit of the business. Um, you know, how do they, what's, what's the financials? How do they sell? What are the people like? Um, and and it, let me ask you there, like how many LOIs or letters of intent have you given and the deal not gone fully through? I mean, like how likely is it if you get an LOI that that deal is going through it? Yeah. So we do probably more work before we write an LOI than most, because we'll, we'll ask for a lot more information than most companies do because we don't like to just write LOIs. Um, a lot of private equity guys will write 10 LOIs. They'll get five of them under contract, but they're only going to close one of those deals. So you don't want to be the four that they don't close. Um, we tend to only write LOIs that we want to close. So to answer your question, we've written, if I exclude the little house painting company that I'm trying to erase from my memory, we can erase. Um, we have written six LOIs, seven. We've written seven LOIs. Um, of those, four have closed. Uh, one, we just couldn't reach an agreement on. Um, one, the seller was a, an, an ex-husband and ex-wife, and the husband desperately wanted to sell, and the wife canceled the LOI after a week because she just wasn't ready, and that was fine. Um, and then uh, we just got a signed LOI for a deal we're working on uh, now. Uh, I got it this morning, so I'm all pumped up about it. All right. So deal number, uh, the, the first deal of 2022 hits the... That's right you know, hits the LOI stage. So you kind of have this process and, and listen, I think good investors uh, do a lot of the upfront work because you don't want to have a reputation of just sending out a bunch of LOIs that don't have yeah. weight to it. But then yeah. it sounds like you do, so you get the LOI, obviously you do diligence, you make sure all the information they said is accurate, which a lot of times, who knows? And, and just to echo one thing on the part of this process, if you have flooring software, and listen, obviously people on this call know that we own Rollmaster, but whether that's Rollmaster, Q Floors, RFMS, CompuFloor, Pacific Solutions, anyone I didn't mention, as long as you have records, it makes due diligence easier, I assume. Um, right. So rather than him handing you like a stack of paper and saying, here's our due diligence, I assume a little download from a flooring software makes your life easier. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. Um, you know, if we, if it, we would figure that out before we ever got to LOI and we probably would never put a company under LOI that, that didn't have reasonable financial records. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that financial records and a scalable process. Like I can't tell you how many retailers yeah. we talk to. I mean, it's our business, but how many retailers we talk to no website, no CRM, no customer records, no financial records, but their credit card still works. That's and perfect. that's fine when you're running your own business, but if you ever want to exit, People yeah. care about that. Something I talk to retailers a lot about is when you sell your business, what are you selling? And if you think you're selling your brand name and your store, you're, you're sure you can. You'll get a much different multiple than if you're selling a system, a process, an automated process, more ho hopefully, yeah. uh, customer records, details, financials. Like you need all of that, not just. Well, look, our store does $2 million and our brand name's been here for 30 years. That's worth something. And it's worth something, just not as much as you want it to be worth. That's right. That is exactly right. So you do the diligence. You then obviously give an agreement. Uh, and then what is the post acquisition? So, okay, uh, we've come to an agreement. We've done the diligence. You you agree that we're doing $2 million in revenue and whatever. Uh, yeah. You know, 200 k in profit. What is the post acquisition process? We signed the dotted line. You wired me a check. I went on a vacation. Now post acquisition, what's what happens there? Yeah, actually, the, the funny thing is that's one of the things we actually have to really manage with the seller. We have to be like, uh, what are you going to do after a close? Because you know, because we we don't need you to come the next day. You know, you should really have a vacation set up. Um, do you have some hobbies that you're interested in exploring? Um, you know, coming to your showroom every day and looking through the window is, is not, not, shouldn't be your hobby. Um, oh man. No, I mean, rule number one is don't screw it up. Right. So our goal is to buy really, uh, good companies that are successful. And so the first thing we do is say, you know what, look, um, we're not going to walk in the door and say, we need to do A, B, C, D. We're just going to walk in and say, look, keep doing what you're doing. 
Um, but hey, now you, the owner's gone. So what do we want to do a little differently? And, and they'll make those decisions. Um, so it's really about empowering the team because one of the things in due diligence, we typically want to have a little bit of access to the team that the owner has built. Yep. And, and we won't buy it if there's not a team. If it's owner centric, we will not acquire the company. So once we get into that onboarding, it's really just about really coaching, empowering that leadership team and staying out of the way. You know, I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. We, we do not see any of our uh, companies more than once a quarter, um, which is great. It's good for them. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, Zoom probably helps that a little bit as well. Um, but if, if I'm a retailer, right, today, and I'm thinking about selling my business, but I don't really know what you guys look for, and I'm just going to assume you guys look for similar things as other people looking to buy, um, you know, flooring businesses. What are the types of things, like even before early engagement, let's go almost backwards here for a second, before early engagement, some of the things you look for when yeah. evaluating a company? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, specifically for us, and it, you know, we do look for a minimum, we're looking for a, a certain sized company. So we really are at a minimum looking for a company that has at least 10 million in revenue. Um, we've done two acquisitions below that, but, um, and that really comes down to, to durability. You know, an owner is gonna leave when we buy the company. And so we have to have a company that's durable, um, that can overcome that big change in who's in charge. and. There isn't an owner there anymore. Um, probably most importantly, we're looking for a leadership team. If there is not a team that um, that the owner can convince us um, is responsible for running day-to-day -day operations of the company, we're not interested because um, there's just not a business there. Um, you know, you have to try and pretend some people can step in, and that just doesn't work very well. Um, we tend to look for a, a top 50 market. So I'm selling a little bit for a second. We look for top 50 markets in the United States because our intent for any company we acquire is to be able to move them from wherever they're at to at least 30 million plus in revenue in their market. And, and I think you phrased that to me last time we talked as like a NFL football yeah. market or something. Yeah, NFL. But there's yeah. some small NFL cities and there's some big cities that don't have the NFL. So. Sure. Um, that's our cheap way of saying it is NFL. Um, and then lastly, it's a consistent story. You would be shocked at how many times we start the conversation with a seller and, and it's just all over the map and they might tell us one thing, but then their numbers tell us something different. And then these other numbers tell us something completely different. And the story isn't consistent, you know, for you to, to be able to buy a company there has to be a consistent story from start to finish. Yeah, you need some predictability, right? Because you guys obviously have a model and you're running your own financial models and that type of stuff. And there's if there's no predictability, the inputs for you, I mean, in the day, it's an investment for you, right? right. Let's call a spade a spade. And you're trying to say, I can give you liquidity. I can buy this business. I'll take on all the risk, but I think I can make some money by improving yeah. whatever. So if you can't have those inputs, then how could you build a model to understand if you can make money, right? right? I mean, it becomes impossible. We can we can guess about a lot of things like why the owner wants to sell or why they chose to do things in a certain way. We can't guess about um, was their revenue eight million or is it six? And is their EBITDA really five hundred thousand dollars or is it two fifty? Like we can't guess about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be a very risky guess. Let's uh, let's call that. I don't like guesses. Yeah. So uh, to, to go into kind of retailers preparing, I want to talk about what retailers can do now. You talked about you talked about like what you look for when you look for a business and how yeah. you go through the process. But retailers now, let's say I've talked to a lot of retailers. They're looking to sell in five to 10 years. And it becomes hard when like you want to sell in a year and you're scrambling and you can't go backwards in time. Right. right. So. What can retailers do now to prepare to try to sell the business in two, five, 10 years from now? How can they get ahead of the game? Yeah. So the most important thing, and quite honestly, the hardest thing for most owners to do is to build a team. 
uh, you know, I, we were joking about this before, but I, I said, if you, if you can't go on vacation for a week, then you don't have a team. Um, you know, owners have to build teams. And quite honestly, the magic that happens there is when you hire and enable and empower great people, they will grow your business for you. And all you have to do is give them their paycheck. Yeah. They will grow your business for you when you hire and trust great people. And so building that team of somebody to run operations and somebody to run the back office and um, maybe somebody to run the sales team, um, you know, somebody to run locations. So enabling those people and either promoting people that you have or, or finding people that are ready to take that step that might even be from outside your organization to build your team, um, a great flooring company has somebody that is a GM. You know, we look for that in every acquisition is, is there somebody that functionally runs the company? They run sales, they run operations, and they run finance. And the owner is the one that they report to. Um, those are the kind of companies you can buy because you can see how you can buy out that owner that owner can walk away and you still have a company where that GM is doing a great job running day-to-day -day operations. So that is the first thing. And that's probably the most important thing by far. And what have you seen? Like you've seen a lot of GMs then like what makes a good GM? Let's say there's some people on this call that don't have a GM. What makes, yeah. what should they look for in a GM? They are all different. Um, you know, we, we have, we have four GMs and none of them are alike. Um, you know, what you have to have is somebody who is passionate about running every aspect of a flooring company. Um, you know, we do typically see a GM that doesn't love finances. Most of the GMs in our industry aren't, aren't, don't love financials, but they do love sales. They love merchandising. They love operations. Some of them come from an installer background, so they understand that. They have to understand 365 degrees of the business. Um, and they have to be willing to hire and trust their team to run the business. So and is it imperative for you that when you buy out the owner that you have a contract already in place with the GM and the team? I mean, cause if you buy it and then the GM leaves and the team leaves, you're stuck. Yeah. So do you, do you get like employment contracts out to those people before the deal is done? You know, we started out trying to really do employment contracts. Um, it turns out people don't like those very much. Um, what they do like is knowing what their comp is going to be and, and comping, you know, we comp our leadership teams extremely well. So my goal is for every GM that we have, they, they couldn't find another job in that market where they made more money. Um, and certainly where they had, where they, they would never find more autonomy because they get to run the company. Yeah, that's fair. So, so we always have a comp plan in place for the GM, which is typically just what was my comp plan before. Um, but then almost always post sale, we will put in a new uh, comp plan that gives them more upside. Yeah, I mean, keeping people skin in the game is is important. And listen, even at our business at Broadloom, we have like your center of 200 people and we look at it, you know, very similarly. There's a question in the chat from uh, yeah. Jason that says, so early in the engagement, is it mostly people that are reaching out to you to sell the business? Or is it? Are you like, going to try to get your own deals, right? Are you calling yeah. people and identifying deals or are they coming to you most of the time? Great question. So we do both. Um, of the deals that we've done, one of them came to us. Um, the rest of them we went out and found. We actually have this uh, super awesome uh, intern um, that's a senior now. Um, and he literally will pull a list and he'll just dial for dollars. Um, which is just a, a slang for he'll get a list that says, here's the, you know, we'll say, let's pull Indianapolis and St. Louis and Kansas city and Denver. And let's start calling every flooring company that looks like it's at least five to 10 million in revenue. And he'll just call in asking for the owner. And when he gets the owner on the phone, he'll say, are you interested in selling your company? <laughs> I want to prime one part of that. How do you know, this is, this is an interesting question. How do you know from just a Google search that they look like a $10 million business? 
So, I mean, we're pulling a list uh, from like Axial, right? So we're, we're pulling a list that is dick, taking guesses at the size of the company, which of course are horribly wrong. Yeah. But then we'll also look at uh, how many, who, where are the multi-location retailers? Because if they have multiple locations, then it's much more likely that, that they're going to have the kind of revenue we're interested in. So, Do you look at the reviews? Um, I mean, we'll look at the reviews after um, after we get engaged, but you know, there's, there are lots of small companies that do such a good job with reviews that they have 400 reviews. They're still, a, they're a $2 million company. They are just great at reviews. It's kind yeah. of funny because the larger companies don't necessarily tend to be great at reviews. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure from your perspective, like you can look at it two ways. A company that's great reviews, great business to buy. A company that's bad reviews, you could turn it around. Also and, great business to buy. That's right. right. Right, exactly. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword there. Um, but anyway, Jason, I hope that answers your question. It seems like it's a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that For when sure. it comes to you know finding deals. Um, I, I'm also curious, like, let's say retailers get, and I, I want you to you know have a minute to pitch kind of you know your guys' vision of your company. But retailers get called all the time. Let's say from private equity company or. Um, some other big flooring store, like why sell to you guys rather than sell to their competitor flooring store or I don't know, some random private equity company? Is there something that you really push out there as the value you can provide versus someone else? Or is it really just liquidity? Yeah, two things. Um, one, there's a pretty well-defined market for flooring companies. If you're a, a $2 million mom and pop, you know, private equity is not buying in that space. We aren't buying in that space. You know, your your potential buyer is maybe a crosstown rival, or it's somebody that's already in your business. Uh, that's 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 almost the only kind of people that buy that business. The larger you get, then absolutely, there's there's private equity in the game. Um, there's us and, and some larger flooring companies that occasionally do things like that. Um, our our value proposition to owners is every company we buy, um, one, when we get to the point where we're gonna acquire, it's because we want that whole thing. We, um, we want the leadership team, we want the employees, we're gonna keep the brand. So people that have built up this 70 year brand in the market, um, and they're proud of it. Owners are proud of their business and they should be. Um, we keep that brand. Um, we don't go to great lengths to say, you know, Joe sold his company to us. Um, we will, we will perpetuate the legacy of that company in the market. Um, yeah. which means their team sticks around. We also do something that's a little unique. We do not centralize, um, functions. So private equity is famous for they'll buy five companies and fire half the back office, centralize accounting, centralize as many things and, yeah. and figure out how to double their return. We don't do any of that. Uh, we believe that you have to have a great team in that market that's going to continually do great work. And so all the teams stick around. Um, that's our, our proposition is we're going to pay you great money for your company. You can exit. We don't want, we don't need you to stick around. Yep. Um, and, and we'll take care of your team. And that's actually what most owners want the most is this combination of, I want money because I'm selling my company, but I also want you to take care of my team because, because I value them. And I, and that's one of the cool things about the genuine nature of, of this industry and the people that own companies is they care as much about how much money they're going to get as they do. They're not going to sell it to somebody who's going to, who's going to kill off their team. Yeah. I mean, they worked hard to build the trust of that team and that without that team, where would they, would they yeah. be? And, and it's funny, I'm drawing parallels in my head. Like we talk a lot to retailers. You need a good website so that you look professional to consumers. You need customer records so that you can follow up with your consumers to provide a great experience. And you need a flooring software, right? To have the right accounting. It's interesting. Like some people say, well, we don't need all that. Like we already have as more business as we need. Maybe we should start pivoting and saying, listen, if you want to look attractive to Nick, and other people looking to buy you, you need to look like you have a professional website, you need customer records, and you need accounting. So if you're not going to do it for more business, at least do it right. to potentially get sold one day for That's a high right. Yeah. Um, I know the million dollar question that a lot of people ask me, and I, 
I'm I don't want to put you on this spot, but give me some rough and let's 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 call this rough estimates. If I'm a business, um, how do I figure out what I'm worth? Right. I get yeah. that question a lot of like, is there just a multiple on EBITDA? And I can just like kind of figure it out. Obviously, there's a lot that can go up or down based on doing the diligence. But is there a rough understanding of what a retailer can roughly expect that they're worth in the flooring industry and yeah. in the current market? What they should want is the typical flooring company sells for around three to four times their EBITDA. And, you know, it can go higher than that. It can, we paid four and a half. Um, is it last year's EBITDA? Is it forward-looking EBITDA? Great question. No, never forward-looking EBITDA. Nope. We, we don't pay for uh, things that have not happened yet. Um, and nobody does, quite honestly, not in this industry. Um, so it's typically, you know, three to four and a half times. And, you know, usually you're trying to look at the last three years to say, is there a consistent performance of growth um, over a three-year period? And you really wait the last year. Um, so the, the Cliff's notes, the, the quick answer is three to four and a half of anywhere between the last three, one to three years worth of EBITDA. Okay. I mean, that's a good place to at least earmark roughly where you can be worth. And listen, if you're thinking about retiring it, being able to fast forward your income for the next four years guaranteed without risk is very attractive. Um, yeah. So I, I get it. Uh, before we wrap up here, I think you have a really interesting view of the flooring industry, similar to myself. You've been outside of it. And I'll put myself on the spot and answer this question after you. But where do you see, after you've been in this industry now for a few years and you've you know helping operate um, a bunch of flooring businesses at this point, where do you see the flooring industry like 5, 10, 20 years from now? I mean, what does the evolution of the flooring industry look like? I think five is easy. Cause I, I just, I don't see a lot of things changing over the next five years in the industry. Uh, it's hard. There, there's no like really early innovative things that are happening that have the ability to transform the industry. In my opinion, uh, 10 years gets a little exciting. You know, we might see some right now there's obviously, you know, there's two big, um, you know, suppliers in this industry of, of product. But there's some really interesting and strong players that are that will challenge them. I think that will shift significantly over the next ten years. I, you know, quite honestly, in a lot of ways, I hope it all stays the same because I love it just the way it is right now. But if we know anything, things are going to change. You know, the easiest way to predict what's going to happen in the next ten years is just look ten years back, um, but add some acceleration to that. So. You know, it's hard to think about what could really transform, you know, like are little nanobots going to install flooring? Probably not in the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, is flooring going to be like 3D printed by a drone in the next 10 years? Probably not in a house, you know, but 20 years, who knows? Uh, 10 years, I think it'll look similar with some changes. Um well, I think something for me, like, and you kind of mentioned it, I actually think there's an easier way to look at it. I think the flooring industry is five to 10 years behind most other industries, right? So, Rather than looking at where we were 10 years ago as an industry, why don't we look at where like progressive industries are today and put ourselves in the shoes of these companies like Allbirds or the companies that used to sell through Nordstrom and now are trying to really own the consumer and the consumer relationship um right it's really like we can draw parallels to other industries that have gone through this digital transformation whether that's the automotive industry you're seeing like look at automotive you have carvana right you have car gurus you have um dealer.com i'm probably forgetting like 10 other ways you can buy cars at this point you would never have thought of that 10 years ago and i think we're probably five or ten years behind yeah. the um auto industry so we can kind of look at the path that they've done and it just become digital first, consumer experience first. I say this a lot, but retailers, in my opinion, are not competing against another retailer. They're not competing against um, Home Depot. They're competing against the consumer experience of Amazon and Uber. Like I, you're competing against the iPhone, right? Consumers now expect things to be as easy as I'm going to click a button, 
and like your website's going to pop up and I'm going to be able to order a sample and I'm going to see it in my room. I'm going to walk around my room and you're going to call me back in 30 seconds. And if you don't, you're probably not going to get my business. And that's what Amazon has trained us and Uber has trained us. So in my opinion, the consumer experience, at least in the next five years, will radically change. And if it doesn't, it's already changed. But if us as an industry don't change, I think you'll start to see a changing of the guard of the people that are willing to be open minded and, and go about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the great thing. So there's two, two quick things. And I don't, I don't know how, how somebody's going to like cut us off or something here in 10 seconds. But, um, you know, I think one of the we have a fascinating moat in retail flooring. Right. And that's actually really just the full service aspect of it, because if all we relied on was selling a product for a price, um, you know, there will be people that will move even more aggressively into that. Right. Floor and decor has shown they can build a huge, massive business just selling products. Um, that is really tough to compete. But throw in installation, um, which none of them want to touch. Um, right. I mean, Home Depot and Lowe's all outsource that. Floor and Decor doesn't even want to touch that. Yep. Um, Amazon briefly touched on, uh, can we try and sell flooring and coordinate with local flooring stores? And then just they threw that out a month or two ago and said, this is ridiculous. Um, we have a huge moat. It's great. So let's capitalize on that and let's continue to grow and evolve our customer experience so that we so that we keep that moat, right? And we don't let the water run dry. Let's, let's just absolutely amplify that moat and make it as great a customer experience from the second they either step into our showroom or come into our website um, to the second we're done installing and they're writing us a five-star review. Um, the second piece that will be interesting, a friend of mine um, works at, at the Arbor Day, right? And so they have huge things that are focused on sustainability. And there is a growing trend of people that want to do business with companies that have thoughtful, sustainable practices. In our industry is really tough to do that, yeah. you know, because we're, we throw stuff out all the time. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how sustainability sneaks into our industry. Um, that might be one of the things that is something that is hard to execute on, but does attract a customer base. Yeah. I think there's a third thing, which is the romanticizing of the products, right? Like you walk into a Home Depot and you're like, I'm, I have a house, I'm looking to put some new hardwood flooring in and it's like the most sterile experience. The guy from the lighting comes over and he's like, yeah, yeah. that one, right? But you go into a flooring store and you feel the passion and you can hear the stories of the brands and the heritage and why, you know, this wood is made very specifically in this teak wood and, and kind of going through that, I don't think a box store could ever or Amazon could ever no. compete with. Um, so before we, we cut out here, I want to do two things. The first one, again, put you on the spot since I seem to like to do that. What, um, what flooring do you have in your, in your house or what do you got? What are you standing on right now? Good question. Uh, we actually, it was funny because we moved into a, a different house about two years ago after we'd already acquired two flooring companies. Uh, but of course none of them are here. So we just had, to, you know, we did business with a local flooring company. That's, that, that's awesome. So uh, we put in uh, one of the, just one of the Cortec products. Um, Cortec for our hardwood or for our hard surface and uh, just a nice little shaw carpet for um, for our carpet. All right. Well, we can leave the uh, we could have a whole conversation about vinyl plank versus hardwood another time. Uh, but but lastly, um, how can people contact you? Let's say they want to reach out. They want to discuss their business. What's the best yeah. way to reach out to you? Yeah, so um, our, our website is probably the easiest, which is just uh, 31stcapital.com. So 31stcapital.com. Uh, I got to be honest. I thought it was 31st Street Capital. Our company is 31st Street Capital, but that's a really long domain. So I just I just kind of threw out the, uh, uh, the street. Yeah, 31st Capital, 31stcapital. Okay. And they can do a contact us there. Um, if they want to toy around with it, we put a little uh, how to value my business. So we put a valuation calculator on there. Oh, cool. Um, so they can play around with that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the easiest way. I'm not quite like I'm not quite ready to do a Todd Saunders and throw my cell phone out for thousands of people. Um, but yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm sure if. If anyone has questions and needs to reach Nick and you can't find Nick at 31st Street Capital or 31st or however you want to do it, 
I'm happy to connect you as well. Uh, yeah. so reach out to me. And I'm no Jason Goldberg, right? Jason is great about offering his help to anybody and everybody as, as you are. Um, but look, I, I'm, I love this industry. We have such great people. Um, I've had plenty of people come to me and say, hey, I'm interested in selling my company and they're not the right size for us. Um, but I love helping. So I'll give people advice on, hey, here's a broker I know in your market who's great. Here's what you should look for in selling your business. Here's how much you might be able to get. Um, so I, I love helping people. It doesn't have to be because they want to sell it to me. And I was going to let you go here, but there was two more questions coming in. So yeah. I'm going to take you for two quick questions here. Um, this is from Jerry Levinson. What advice would you give to the little guy? Uh, he, the guy that doesn't do over a million dollars or the guy that doesn't do over a million dollars, what are things they can do rather than just walk away? What is their exit opportunity for a one or $2 million store? I mean, their exit is you call your competitor and say, do you want to add a location? Um, or it's, it's a salesperson or, you know, for that person, they maximize their money by betting on somebody and saying to their, um, you know, maybe it's their ops person or their best salesperson, or even an, their, an, a big installer team and say, Hey, none of them are going to have $500,000 in cash to pay you. Right. And so instead you just say, look, I want to sell my company. It, we're doing $150,000 worth of EBITDA. I think it's worth 450. Can you pay me, you know, uh, $75,000 a year over the next five or six years and buy the company from me? You know, just something where they can, they can bet mutually on success of the company and get paid that way. Because if they just try and say, I'm selling it for four fifty, I hate to say this, but uh, probably nobody's buying it. Sure. They'll eventually, I mean they'll eventually just lock it up. Honesty is honesty. Then the last question is, uh, what can a three to $4 million company in a smaller but like a high growth market do to make, you know, make themselves more attractive for a buyer. So yeah. they're close to your number not close enough, but they're in a smaller market that's grown fast. Yeah. I mean, small is, you know, we have to define small, right? So um, there are people that buy companies that just want to, that are going to be consistent cash flow long-term and growth doesn't need to be part of the equation. But the other part is we typically underestimate how much business we can get out of a market. Like a million dollar or a, a million person market um, can easily support a forty million dollar um, retailer, just retail, not builder, nothing else, just just retail. So if you're in a two hundred thousand dollar market, I mean, I'm in a two hundred thousand dollar market, and there's a thirty five million dollar company um, in this market. Now they have another locate, they have locations outside this market, but uh, to be attractive for a buyer. Look, you're probably close. So um, be the guy that dominates a bunch of rural fifty to one hundred thousand dollar towns, um, and and figure out how to grow. But if it's just how to be attractive as a three to four million dollar company, I hate to say it, but you're kind of stuck. Um, three to four million is just the wrong size to sell. It's too big to sell to a mom and pop, and it's too small to attract outside. So you got to figure out how to hire some people, trust them, and and grow it to ten, and then you make some real money. Right. And listen, the, the honest answer always is also just grow your EBITDA. And that's very attractive too, right? If you're yeah, we didn't get into this, but one of the mistakes people make is thinking that um, they'll build a company around them, right? A genius with a thousand helpers. They'll get their EBITDA to 20% and they'll think somebody's going to pay them a multiple on a 20% EBITDA company. And you go in and you realize everything revolves around the owner and, and, and that guy never sells his business ever. Yeah, totally makes sense because the whole business is built on their back and around them. Without them, it falls apart. That's right. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, Nick. Yeah. Uh, next week, for everyone watching, we will have uh, Thera Williams from Floors to Go. He's going to be talking about how his store, who I think he's been in business for 40 plus years, went from 30% margins to 50% margins over the last six months. So that'll be a really interesting conversation. Uh, again, that's next Wednesday at 1 p.m. And thanks again, Nick. Appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thank you, Todd.